Ah, good morning, everybody. Um, apologize for being late. Man, I had a long work day yesterday and I was tired. But we're going to continue on with this message today. So God bless you in Jesus' name. And we're going to open with a song from the Soul Stirring Hymns, uh, number 309, called Dare to Be a Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. 309. <clears throat> Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command. Honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Amen. Amen. As, as dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. Um, our opening verse today is going to be in Psalms, the book of Psalms, chapter 29. Chapter 29. If you have a King James Bible, you could read along with me. Psalms chapter 29. We're going to read the whole um, chapter. The Bible says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve, the dis and discovereth the forests, and in his temple doth every one speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood, yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. The word of the Lord. Greetings, friends and colleagues. It's Sean Elvis. Like I said, I apologize for the late message today, but we have a message from God today, nevertheless. So we're going to continue on and give thanks for what we got. Um, in today's video, I'm going to be wrapping up my little mini series. Uh, I did like a little mini trilogy um, talking about the majesty of the Bible, the majesty of the Bible. And in, you know, and in part one, if you missed it, go back and uh, watch part one where I discuss the importance of the Bible and, you know, why we should read it, what it is, why we should have a copy of it for ourselves. And then I went on in part two to explain uh, the importance of preaching and why preaching the Bible um, is important. And we also covered the history of how we got the King James Bible in the first place. Excuse me. And now here we are in part three where... <laughs> I'm going to give a brief overview of the whole Bible. We're going to take, we're going to take a flyby and, and take a look at the Bible from a bird's eye's perspective. And then I'm going to discuss how to use the Bible, how to apply it to our lives, and, we, and how we can make use of this majestic book. Um, so I want to begin with a question. I'm going to ask you a question. Would you rather die for the truth... Or would you rather live for a lie? That's the question. Would you rather die for the truth or live for a lie? Let's start um, by talking about the Bible. I told you I'd give you an overview, so that's where we're going to begin. The Bible is broken up into two main sections called the Old Testament and the New Testament. The word testament means um, covenant or promise, and it's God's promise. In other words, we have the old promise before Jesus, 
And then when Jesus came along, he changed everything into a new promise. Not that we're still not saved by faith. Um, we've always been saved by faith, by grace through faith, the Bible says. But um, back then, God had a different uh, promise for us, a different covenant, where, where now um, things are different. But anyway, there's a... Uh, there's 66 books in the Bible total, and if I don't know if your Bible has a, a table of contents. Most of them do, uh, the table of contents. You'll see it's broken up into, let's see if I can get it on camera. You got the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament has 39 books from Genesis to Malachi, and the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation has 27 books. And the original King James Bible was actually printed also with another section of 14 books called the Apocrypha, which we're not going to cover today. But basically what the Apocrypha is, is it's books of the Bible that give good history from the time period of the end of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Um, but they aren't considered God's word. They aren't considered scripture. Inspired by God. Um, but anyway... Some, some people do believe they are inspired, some people don't. So King James originally did put them in there for you to decide and read for yourself. But we're not going to talk about those today. Um, we're going to just take a, a brief look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, break, is broken down in four main sections. You have the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. Uh, and, and I kind of briefly uh, covered this in part one, which I'm not going to go over again, but... Genesis to Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy were written by Moses, which covers, you know, uh, from creation all the way to Moses, which is uh, known as the first five books of law or the first five books of Moses. And then from there, uh, starting from uh, Joshua to about Esther, um, through Esther, we get uh, what's known as the historical books. This is where you get the history of the kings, like King David, King Solomon, and and uh, King Saul. Um, these are these are the historical sections of books. And the and the Old Testament, the, the in the original Hebrew wasn't set up this way, but I'm just going to go over what uh, um, kind of the modern English Bible, um, the way they have the books set up. And then after Esther, you get into Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. And these are considered more of like the poetic books, um, especially, song, um, especially Psalms, uh, which is, uh, I, I believe it's one of the largest books in the whole Bible. Um, has the most chapters. Um, it's the longest one. And it's just a book of nothing but songs. Um, and, and so... Basically, you know, that's why I start all my videos off with singing, you know, because, I mean, I figure it's it's pretty important if, if one of the largest books in the Bible is just nothing but song. Singing to the Lord and giving praise to Him is pretty important. So that's why I do that. The Lord delights when we sing to Him, even though we can't sing very good. And uh, But anyway, uh, basically the rest of the books, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah... Uh, Lamentations would probably go under, I would put that under uh, poetry, but I think it's because it flows better right after Jeremiah. They have Lamentations there. Um, and then Ezekiel, Daniel, are, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel are considered the major prophets in Daniel. And then you have the 12 minor prophets, which are smaller books, uh, written by the latter prophets before uh, the end of the Old Testament, um, Hosea through Malachi. So that's um, the basic story of the Old Testament. Now, if you read the story starting back in Genesis, God basically, he creates everything, creates the whole universe, um, creates man and woman, and, and everything's fine. And then and then man decides to disobey God and sin and get in, and get into trouble, right? And and then eventually they they uh, fall into captivity of a wicked city called Babylon, and then God uh, makes a promise, a covenant, if you will, and says, you know what? I'm going to send you a leader who's going to come and he's going to save you. 
And then if you keep reading through the historical books, you get introduced to a holy man of God named Abraham and his wife, Sarah. And you know, God promises to make uh, Abraham a great family, a great nation called uh, Israel. That's why they're called the Israelites from his son, Jacob, who um, eventually, or is it his grandson? But anyway, his, his, uh, the, that's why they're called the Israelites, because um, God changes Jacob's name to Israel. And then eventually Israel disobeys God again. We, so you're going to see a theme, a, cy- a cycle of God creates something good. He establishes something good. And then man goes and ruins it, right? We get into trouble. Um, we go into captivity into Babylon, right? A wicked city takes over us. And then um, the prophets or God himself proclaims, hey, I'm going to come save you guys, right? I love you guys. I'm going to send you a, a savior, to redeem you. Well, the second time they fell into captivity, um, God said, I'm going to send you a savior that's going to save you once and for all, right? So I could redeem you all forevermore. And then uh, that's basically how the Old Testament ends. We don't ever see that savior come until the New Testament where Jesus comes on the scene, right? Our literal savior. Um, So, but see, that's where the tricky part gets into because people thought back then that God was going to send a king to destroy all the other nations. And, and he will. He will because that's what he promised. But Jesus comes first as a lamb, right? He comes first as a lamb uh, who, who didn't set up any earthly kingdom here yet. Um, but basically, the New Testament's broken down into four uh, main sections as well. Uh, we have the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are considered the Gospels. The word gospel just means good news. And these are um, men who personally lived with Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They were his closest uh, disciples, called his apostles. And they give accounts of Jesus' life. And they, for the most part, they tell the same story. Um, they're slightly different. Not that they're uh, not that one discredits the other. They all um, credit each other, um, but they tell it from a little bit different perspective. And then you get into the uh, Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, which continues the story after uh, the death of Jesus. And they continue this story um, explaining what the apostles went through afterwards. A lot of persecution. Um, a lot of them died. Actually, I think all of them died. Except for John. I think John was the only apostle who didn't die. Uh, as far as, um, well, I mean, he died, but uh, I'm talking about he wasn't martyred. They, he, they didn't murder him for his beliefs and what he was uh, claiming about Jesus. And then we get uh, to the letters where uh, the apostle Paul wrote letters to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, and then, of course, Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Um, so he's writing personal letters to men, men of God, that he's training. And then he's also writing to churches, the churches at Rome, the churches at Corinthians. Uh, these are cities that he's, uh, and he's basically giving guidance on, on and, and direction on how to run the church now that Jesus is gone and what, and what we should do in the New Testament now that we have a more, what the Bible says, a more sure word of prophecy. Um, And then there's an anonymous writer who writes the book of Hebrews. And then we have two books, James and Jude, which are uh, um, the brothers or stepbrothers, if you want to call them, uh, of of Jesus himself. And then we have Peter and John, uh, the apostles of Jesus, who also wrote uh, two books. Well, technically... uh, you have First Peter, Second Peter, and First, Second, and Third John. But anyway, and then it closes with Revelations, which is a book about prophecy the, uh, and things that are haven't happened yet that they're going to happen in the future. So, um, but all throughout the Bible, we we basically see a theme. You know, uh, God establishes something good. We humans screw it up, and then God promises to rescue us and redeem us from our sins. So that's kind of the theme of the Bible: is God's mercy. And his love, and that even though we can get ourselves into trouble, um, God comes and he, and he still loves us enough to uh, get us out of it. Um, 
But that's a brief overview of the Bible for the people who maybe don't know much about the Bible. But um, I want to get into a little message here today. Uh, And so open up your Bible uh, to Daniel chapter number three. Daniel chapter number three. Um, Just before the 12 prophets, you have uh, the main prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Um. So we're going to read Daniel chapter 3, and, and the opening song I sang is called Dare to Be a Daniel. You know, you know it's, it's about this man named Daniel, who's a man of God in the Old Testament. Maybe you've heard of the story of uh, Daniel in the lion's den, right? Where Daniel refused to obey the king's orders. The king uh, commanded everybody not to pray to God, but Daniel disobeys the king, and he prays to God anyways, so he gets thrown in the lion's den. Um but God saved him. The lions did not eat him up. And eventually uh, he goes on to uh, become a, a governor or, or a high ruler in, in Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar's authority. And, and, and what we're going to read, though, is we're going to read the next story after that um, of three holy men named uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's, it's a very similar story to Daniel's story, but it's a shorter version. And I want to use this story to illustrate my point that um, the Bible is not only an important book, but we need faith. We need faith to uh, read the Bible, to really make use of the Bible, rather. Um, you see, there's two ways that we could read the Bible. We could either excuse me, we could, one, read the Bible with faith, and we can believe it. We could believe that, hey, this is God's Word, it's powerful, or we could read it without faith, You're right? That, that this book has no power, um, it's just a man-made book. So there's two ways to read the Bible, but I, I want to share with you uh, briefly before we get into this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You ever listen to a sermon or somebody preaching about the Bible and you thought, man, they're talking, are they talking about me? Are they, <laughs> are they talking straight to me? You know, that's because the word of God is powerful. You know, when you preach the word of God, it can really just pierce right into your soul and into your spirit and get into your heart and change things. You know, it has the power to move you to do things and give you courage and strength. You know, anytime you're going through something, uh, maybe a tough time in your life or you're not feeling good, maybe maybe you're sad about something that happened or you're stressed over things that are going on in your life, that's the best time to pick up the book Pick up the Bible and read it, you know, because it's powerful. It can, can get into your heart and transform you and give you and, and breathe new life back into you and give you energy and renew your spirit. You know, so let's look at this story here in Daniel. And we're going to start in uh, in verse number one. I said, did I tell you Daniel chapter three? Daniel chapter three, uh, starting in verse one, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. And the breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the prince, or excuse me, in the province of Babylon. So, King Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Um, let's keep reading, verse two. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to get uh, sent to sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, councils, sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. What is this image? It's a false image. It's not God. It's it's an idol. Verse 3. Then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, treasurers, and counselors, and sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, uh, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and, and, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the uh, cornet, flute, harp, suckbutt, psaltery, dulcimer, 
and all kinds of music, ye, f- ye shall ye fall down and worship the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar the, the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship shall, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So we see here that the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar have this false idol, this false god. And it's an idol that he wants everybody to bow down to and worship when the Bible says uh, that you shall only worship the Lord thy God. That's the first commandment in the Bible. And the second commandment says, do not make any false images. Well, that's exactly what the Babylonians were doing. But, you know, this this also reminds me uh, of, of how the government creates... Um, well, at least for the government here where I live in Colorado, they have these things called statutes, these laws. Um, and it always reminds me of in the Bible, uh, the idol worship like this, where, um, where they're actually uh, worshiping statues. <laughs> and it, so it, it just makes me think of um, the, the statutes of, of the laws of Colorado. Uh, or what are they called? The uh, Colorado State Statutes. <laughs> it always reminds me of... False gods, you know, uh, they're they're not getting their their laws from God's word. They're they're man made um, man made statutes, <laughs> statues, um, which is you know you got which which has no power, right? It has no authority. Only God's word has power. That's what we read in the Bible, anyway. So let's skip down to verse twelve, um, and let's keep reading. For the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to skip through. Uh, it says, there are, there are certain Jews whom hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not the, thy gods, nor worship the old golden image which thou hast set up. So these are three rebels <laughs> in the kingdom of Babylon, three Jews, three men of God, who said, you know what? We're not going to worship your statues. We're going to continue to worship God. We're not going to... Follow your uh, your idol worship here in Babylon. Go ahead and throw us in the furnace if that's what you have to do. Because we're not going to stop serving God. So, and, I, and, and going back to my original question I asked you. Would you rather live to do what's right? Or excuse me, die doing what's right? Or um, live and do what's wrong? Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose death. They said, you know what? We'd rather serve God and do what's right. And um, be put to death. And to bow down to your false god and uh, live. Um, Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that, um, that, uh, do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? So, uh, let's skip 15, go to 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Let's also read 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told the king, Hey, look, our God's so powerful that he can save us from your fire, from your furnace. He might not do so. He may or may not. It's up to our God to do that, to save us. But whether he saves us or not, we're going to obey him. And, you know, that's the faith we need to have. You know, whether blessings come in our life or not, we need to do what's right anyways. And that's why I asked you that question. You know, uh, whether, you're, whether your life prospers doing the right thing or whether it uh, doesn't prosper, are you going to do the right thing? Um, so these guys knew that the king, you know, he's going to throw them in the fire. And, you know, they still refused. But uh, let's look again at verse 18. It says, Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. See, there's people nowadays who you couldn't even pay to read the Bible. 
these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had so much faith that they said, not only are we not going to read the Bible, that even if you threaten to kill us, we're still not going to stop reading the Bible. Now that's some faith. That's some courage. And you know, that's the courage we need to have as Christians. You and and you want to know how to really use the Bible? You have to have faith. You can't be afraid of the bad things that might come to you in your life because bad things will come um, one way or the other. So you have to decide before you pick up this book and read it, hey, am I going to read this book by faith? Or am I just going to read it um, and then when bad things start happening, I'm going to put it away. <laughs> right? You have to make that decision first. You know, faith is what uh, gives um, this book power, you know. Anybody can own a copy of this book. Um, anybody can read a copy of this book. There's atheists who have read the Bible. Um, but it, it's powerless without faith. I mean, there are more Bibles sold in the world more than any other book throughout the whole world. But you know what the sad thing is? Even proclaiming Christians who own a copy of the Bible, who take their Bible to church every Sunday, Less than 30% of them actually read the Bible when they go home. <laughs> so they so they take the Bible to church every single Sunday, but when they get home, they put it back up on their shelf, they leave it there until next Sunday. You know, maybe that's because they don't understand the power of the Bible. They don't know how to use the Bible. This Bible is powerful. I want you to hold your place there in Daniel. We'll come back to it. So, um, but let's, but turn to Ephesians in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter six. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read for you Revelations 22, 19, uh, which says, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. See, the King James Bible has 700 and 88,258 words, if you calculate every single word in the King James Bible. 788,258. Now compare that to the ESV Bible. The ESV has 757,493 words, and even less in the NIV. The NIV has 227,969 words. I said, where did all these words go? You know, Proverbs 30, chapter 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Every single word in your King James Bible is powerful. You say, well... If you, have, if you have an NIV or an ESV or some other Bible who have less words, you, you don't have the full word of God, do you? You don't have the full power of God's word. Now, where did I tell you to turn? Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to read verses 13 through 17, which says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I want to focus in there on that verse 17. It says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God, your Bible, is a sword. It's a weapon. I mean, and it, and it should go accompanied with your faith, right? Like I said, you need faith along with this Bible to give it power. But faith, faith is a shield, we see here. Faith is a defensive weapon. It stops attacks from coming in. But the Bible, the Word of God, is an offensive weapon. It helps us fight the enemy off. You know, there are people who have faith. A lot of people who have faith, they believe the Bible, they're saved, they're going to heaven, but they don't read their Bible, right? And and you can't just win a battle, right, with just 
with just a shield, right? If I if I marched off into battle and I left my sword behind and I just took my shield, you know, I'm not going to win that fight. You also need your offensive weapon. You need your Bible. You need to have the Word of God. And um, <clears throat> did you know that the words or the phrase, it is written, is found 80 times in the Bible? I want you to turn to uh, Matthew, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter... Four, this is where the devil is attacking Jesus. He's tempting Jesus. Jesus is in the wilderness. Um, the devil's tempting Jesus to, to fall into sin. And, and just like Nebuchadnezzar tempted uh, all the Babylonians, hey, bow down to this idol. Well, that's what uh, the devil's tempting him. And I want you to see how Jesus responds to this attack that the devil's attacking him and tempting him with. So Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 says... Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And notice what Jesus says in verse 10. He says, Then Jesus said unto him, So this is Jesus responding to the devil, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus is quoting scripture. He's quoting the Old Testament, specifically Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, which is the law of Moses that God gave to Moses. Excuse me. But um, So Jesus said, it is written. It is written. Written where, Jesus? Written in the Bible. Written in the Bible. Jesus quoted the Bible. He quoted scripture. When the devil attacked him, Jesus deflected his attack with his faith. And he counterattacked with his offensive uh, sword. With the Bible. With scripture. He counted, He counterattacked the devil. Just like if I had a sword. Um, it would not do me any good if I didn't know how to use that sword. Right? So, you need to know how to use your Bible. You need to know... Where scriptures are in the Bible, you need to know how to quote these scriptures. What do they say? And you know that's why I use the King James Bible because it's accurate translation in the English. You know, if you have the ESV, you might misquote God's word. God forbid you would have no power if you don't actually quote God's word. See, the devil he can't quote God's word. If every time you you read the devil, he always twists God's word just a little bit. Maybe it's one word or something. But he doesn't quote God's word exactly true right now. Even though, yeah, I'm not saying faith can't save you. Of course faith can save you. We're saved by faith, by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9. But of course, I'm, I'm saying faith can save you. Faith will save you and take you to heaven, absolutely. But when we're, when we're battling temptation, when the devil comes to tempt us to sin in this lifetime, why not have, I mean, yeah, you're going to have the shield of faith. But why not also have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the Bible. You know, friends, if you don't fight back, you're, the devil's just going to keep attacking you and attacking you and attacking you. You know, I, I want you to look down again at verse uh, number 11 here. We, we didn't read it yet, but in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11 after Jesus uh, quotes the scripture to, to Satan, it is written, he says, or the Bible says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Don't you want the devil to leave you alone? Stop tempting you? You know, I mean, uh, sooner or later, all those temptations, you're going to cave in, right? It happens all the time. Why don't you fight back? How are you going to do that? You need the word of God. You need to quote the scripture back to the Satan. Every time those temptations come in, quote the Bible. Read the Bible. That's your sword. That's your offensive attack to get the devil to leave you alone. See, after Jesus quoted the scripture, Satan left. Right? See, so you're, you're going to have to believe the Bible. You're going to have to read the Bible. You're going to have to study the Bible. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Quote it. When's the last time you said, it is written? It is written. You know, maybe somebody, uh, maybe they, um, 
offer you to have a drink of alcohol and you say, it is written, <laughs> be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion walketh in about, seeking whom he may devour. Quote the Bible. You know, friends, we need to understand how important the Bible is. It's a majestic book. It has power because it's God's word. Now, see, I couldn't cover everything that I wanted to about this Bible. This book's so amazing. It's so majestic um, in just three short mini series. Um, but the point I wanted to make today is this, you know, that we need faith. We need faith to use our Bible properly and to get the full most out of this majestic book here, this treasure that we have. We need to have faith. And with that faith, we need to also understand that this Bible is a powerful weapon. God's word is powerful. You say, well, I don't like to fight, Sean. I don't believe in fighting. Well, listen, the devil, the devil believes in fighting. And he's coming after you. He's going to tempt you whether you believe it or not. He's going to come and he's going to tempt you to do wrongs. And unless you fight back with, a, with God's word, God's powerful word, he's not going to leave you alone. He's going to keep coming back. Even if you have faith, he's going to keep coming back. And eventually, he's going to break through your armor. Um, so don't give him a reason to attack you anymore. Hit him back with an offensive weapon. Get busy. Uh... I, I, I know, for, for my own personal experience, when I'm reading the Bible, when I'm studying the Bible, the temptations of the devil go away. You know, I'm too busy uh, studying the Bible because the, the devil knows. He knows, hey, if I attack Sean, uh, he's going to hit me with that powerful sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And that, that, that hurts, right? So he leaves me alone. And so let, let that be a lesson to us and, and to you and to encourage you to... Pick up your Bible, read it with faith, and understand it has power. That's my message for the day, guys. Um, the Bible, the Bible is, a, is a powerful book, and it, and it doesn't come um, with our own ideas, right? Don't 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 let the Bible, um, don't let your ideas shape what you see in the Bible. Let the Bible uh, shape your ideas, if you know what I'm saying, right? We need we need to let the Bible drive us. We can't drive the Bible. Anyways, that's my message for the day, guys. God bless you, and that wraps up my little mini-series. As always, um, I'll be giving God the last word. Uh, we're going to be finishing the story of Daniel chapter 3 um, as our final reading. But before then, let's bow in prayer. And God bless you guys. Thanks for listening. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious uh, gift that you've given us, your word your holy word that we can read and we could study and and we could use to uh fight off the temptations of the devil because they will come lord and no matter how much faith we have the devil just keeps coming and without your word lord we would not be able to strike back offensively and we we appreciate you giving it giving that to us we ask that you help us understand the bible better lord and how powerful it is and sometimes we often try to fight this spiritual battle with uh, worldly um, physical weapons and tools, but Lord, nothing's more powerful in, than your word in this spiritual battle. And you gave us your word, which is like a sword, Lord, and help us learn how to use it and give us the courage. Give the listener who heard this message today uh, the strength and the faith to stand up to the devil and to use your word to fight him off, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, had the courage to stand up to the king, Lord, and take a stand for your word. Lord, uh, just give us the strength and the courage to stand up to the devil. We love you, Lord, and we love your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, we're going to close with a... Uh, as always, we're going to give God the last word. So I'm going to finish uh, the story in Daniel chapter 3 um, from verses 19 to the end of the chapter. God bless you guys. Have a good day. Uh, Daniel chapter 3 verse 19. <clears throat> then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his vis uh, visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace Seven times more. 
then it uh, then it won't be then it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their horses, and their, and their hats, and their garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, that the flames of the fire killed, slew, the, slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was uh, astoned, and rose up in a haste, and spake, and said unto uh, his counselors, Did not we cast three men uh, bound into the midst of the fire? Then they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then uh, Nebuchadnezzar came near uh, the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth unto the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men, whose bodies the fire hath no power, nor was an hair on their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell nor the smell of the fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo, who who hath sent his angels and delivered his servants that trusted in him. And have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they may that they might not serve nor worship any god except their god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, every nation, and every language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver. After this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen.